however you are and whenever you are. Welcome, good souls of the planet and beyond to Paranormal Now. I'm your host, Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Tonight's guest is paranormal researcher Christopher O'Brien, who has investigated hundreds of unexplained events in South Central Colorado, North Central New Mexico, and has fantastic stories of high strangeness from the ground up. So we'll get lost in time as we cruise along here. And moving forward next week, a roundtable discussion on the Phoenix Lights with Kevin D. Randall, Mike Rogers, and Peter Robbins. That'll be an exciting time. And then our general lineup for the next month or so for future episodes includes Ryan Sprague to talk ufology, Dr. Joseph Burks on miraculous experiencer healings, Michael Masters, who suggests aliens may be our future descendants, Tui Snyder on the haunted side of living, and Brian Forrester of Hidden Inca Tours to get serious about the Paracas' elongated skulls and what the latest research has to say about an ET connection. Share your thoughts and experiences with us during or after the show on Facebook, facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio, on Instagram at Paranormal Now, and on Twitter at Paranormal underscore Now. And of course, you can join us in the KGRA chat room. And hopefully I will see your questions if you have them for our guest tonight. I am stoked. I, I love anything to do with sacred places. And that's something I'd like to talk to Chris about tonight. But before we take that on, I want to read this article to you from the Capitol Press by Sierra Dawn McLean in regard to cattle mutilations. Authorities are continuing to investigate the death and mutilation of five bulls on a remote eastern Oregon ranch. The bulls, worth 7,000 each, were found dead and mutilated with genitals and tongues cut out on Sylvie's Valley Ranch in Harvey County, Oregon. Two carcasses were discovered July 30th. On July 31st, three more carcasses were found. The cause of death is unknown, but investigators suspect one or more people are responsible. Harney County Sheriff's Office Deputy Dan Jenkins is the primary investigator. The Oregon State Police and the Mile Here National Forest Emigrant Creek Ranger District are also on the case. As of August 7th, according to Joshua Giles, a forest ranger with the district, the investigation continues with no clear leads. As an isolated incident, the case might appear a strange fluke, but according to the FBI, thousands of killings and mutilations of cows have happened since the 1970s. The animals typically die in the same way, with the same body parts removed. Jenkins said it's hard to tell how these five bulls died. There are no entry wounds. A metal detector scan revealed no bullets. According to the National Weather Service data, the past month has had no major lightning storms in the area that could have killed the cattle. Colby Marshall, vice president of Sylvie's Valley Ranch, said there were no outright signs of a struggle. No rope burns on trees, no scattered hoof prints, no strangulation marks, no blood. The bulls, he said, looked like they simply fell over and died. Maybe they were poisoned, said Jenkins. But if they were, it could not have happened by natural causes, Jenkins said. Ty Campbell, the property owner's son, along with Clint Weaver, the cow boss, scoured the property looking for poisonous plants, but found none. Jenkins said a ne- necropsy to determine the case of death was not possible when the bulls were found. They were already past the 24-hour window when a veterinary inspection would have been effective. Marshall, the ranch's vice president, said the bulls had probably been dead for two to three days when they were found. Even stranger than the deaths, Jenkins said, are the mutilations. Only a few parts of the carcass were removed on each animal. The anus, scrotum, testicles, and tongues. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? One bull was also missing its penis and the tip of one ear. Now, what's strange about this case is that the areas with missing parts don't appear to have been chewed. Jenkins, the deputy, said the wounds, when examined, appeared clean cut. The parts were definitely cut out with a sharp blade, he said. There weren't any signs of predatory eating or chewing. They were cut out by at least one person. The Oregon Cattlemen's Association has offered a reward of up to 1000 to anyone who could provide information leading to the arrest and conviction of whoever is responsible, or whatever is responsible. And a separate $25,000 reward is also being offered by an interested party. Um, cattle mutilations have not been quite the popular topic for some time. <laughs> it, it certainly you know, ebbs and flows, as it were, waxes and wanes, and 
comes up now and then. And I, I'd like to find out what, you know, what Chris thinks about this. I know a lot of people have become more skeptical of the actual cause causes of these mutilations since the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so again, I'm stoked for tonight's episode. And, oh, you know, I also want to make a note. I don't know how all y'all feel, but I don't think it matters what age you are. If you use words like stoked or dude or whatever you want to use, I'm kind of getting tired of people saying at your age, you shouldn't be using words like that. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Who are you to judge my choice of vocabulary? All right. So. Ooh, okay. that's grody, man. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I've got your support, Chris. All right. So now call-ins are now available to all of you. As we roll out our new HD toll-free phone line sponsored by the Paranormal Radio app. So add this number to your mobile phone so you can call us hands-free at 85-KGRA-LIVE. That's 855-472-5483. Listen for your cue to call in and pose your questions to the guest or myself. And make sure to save the new Paranormal Radio app hotline number, 85-KGRA-LIVE. And that's coming in the last half hour of the show tonight. From 1992 to 2002. Christopher O'Brien investigated hundreds of unexplained events in South Central Colorado, North Central New Mexico. His investigative work is chronicled in the Mysterious Valley book trilogy and this field investigation of UFOs, cattle mutilations, crypto creatures, haunted sites, etc. has produced one of the largest databases of unusual occurrences from a single geographic reason, region. Today, a sophisticated multi-sensor surveillance setup called UFODAP, U-F-O-D-A-P, is being installed there in a groundbreaking effort to scientifically monitor ongoing anomalous activity in the region. O'Brien has appeared in over 80 TV show segments, including Ancient Aliens, Inside Edition, Extra Strange Evidence, and he co-produced the film It Could Happen Tomorrow, winner of the 2012 EBE Film Festival Awards for Best Feature and the People's Choice Award. His latest book, Stalking the Herd, is easily the most comprehensive book ever written about the misunderstood cattle mutilation mystery. Chris, welcome to Paranormal Now. <laughs> well, that uh, little news item is an interesting way to start the show. I must say it's, uh, it's, it's quite an unusual case for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the mutilation phenomenon uh, has, I would say, 95% of these cases in North America have happened east of the Rockies. Um, so to have cases west of the Rockies is uh, curious. It's also unusual because it's very, very rare to find more than one bull mutilated. To have five bulls uh, found in this condition mm -hmm. is practically unheard of. Uh, I'd really have to check uh, my database uh, to find a similar case. I don't think there is one. So th that also makes it unusual. Um, one thing that uh, my mentor, David Perkins, uh, who's helping me write the follow-up book to Stalking the Herd, he's, David's been involved in these types of uh, animal death investigations since 1975. And uh, one thing that he came up with early on in the late 70s was he noticed that cattle mutilations tend to uh, uh, group around areas or regions that are downwind and downstream from where we utilize uranium, uh, whether we mine it there, weaponize it, uh, enrich it, use it in power plants, have it in missile silos and missile fields. Um, for various reasons, it seems that these cases tend to cluster downwind and downstream from where we utilize that sort of material. Now, I find it interesting that uh, the, the Fukushima catastrophe that happened uh, 11 and a half years ago, mm -hmm. or in 1911, or 2011, um, so it's been, what, uh, I guess about eight years now, um, almost nine, going on nine years uh, the fact that that happened in Japan and the West Coast was hit with a, a pretty sizable dose of airborne radiation uh, four days after the event. David and I were thinking that we would start to see cases on the West Coast, which normally has very, very, very few 
mutilation reports. Um, there have been some. Uh, they did, again, they do tend to cluster around uh, uh, nuclear power plants and uh, places where they weaponize or um, enrich uh, uranium, such as the Hanford plant up in Washington, other uh, power plants uh, up and down the coast. There does seem to be a correlation with those plants, but there haven't been near the cases that we've seen in Colorado, Montana, um, and and west, you know, again, east of the Rockies. So this is this is interesting. This hopefully is not the beginning of a wave of these cases uh, where someone may be using soft tish, tissue organs from these animals to ascertain the amount of uh, damage being done by above ground radiation in the tissues, um, yeah. or, or whether the animals are being affected by uh, by the environmental radiation effects. Um, Again, this is just like, a theory, yeah. but uh, but, but it, it does fall into that category. And to have five bulls in one case is, is I'm pretty sure, unprecedented. So this is a very, very interesting and, I think, uh, an important case. Well, I think that's the takeaway. Are cattle mutilations back in business? You know, is what? And well, they've never gone out of business. They've been down in South America since 2002. We've been just inundated. Sure, with thousands sure. of cases down there, and and here in North America, uh, by the end of the '90s, uh, they began to peter out, and <laughs> pardon the expression, um, and then kind of slowly dissolve back into the into the sort of rumor mill. I think by then a lot of the ranchers realized it didn't it didn't really help if they if they reported these cases. Um, they they knew their sheriffs really couldn't do anything. Nothing had been done in 30 years, uh, and so I think a lot of cases are going are going unreported for the simple reason that the the ranch is just not interested in in uh, you know creating a lot of of attention. So you think Possibly. here in the in the northern hemisphere, um, there's just been an underreporting of it. Yeah, lately, yeah, in the last twenty years, absolutely. So. And you and you think that's just because people have been exposed to it for a while? It's nothing new and exciting. And well, I think it's you know once a once a rancher loses his head of livestock, it's a lost investment. So any amount of attention that he puts on it is just uh, you know throwing good money after bad, like getting a, re- a veterinarian out to do a, a necropsy to find out the cause of death. That's all money that he's losing on top of the money that he's lost uh, from losing a head of livestock. Often when these uh, these these cases, uh, often they include, you know, the breeding stock. And so he's not only lost the cow, he's lost the resulting offspring that uh, the average cow can produce, which could be up to about six animals. Right. What is your theory on this what is is exactly happening here is this an extraterrestrial thing or is there something else going on here no i um as the sheriff noted in his um summation uh to the press it looked like the animals had been cut with a sharp knife Mm -hmm. that is the uh most common description that you'll find um what about because i mean people have reported laser-like cuts but is that only an observation has that really been supported that's no no there's there have been cases that have been cut by high heat they've been extremely uh uh, they're having you know in in terms of 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 averages and percentages it's maybe two to five percent if even that you hear a cookie cutter incision that's an extremely rare uh, the thing as well. I've only had one case out of 200, for instance. Um, high heat cases, I've only had two cases. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes when an untrained eye sees a dead animal lying out in the pasture, he, he doesn't understand um, all the processes that go into uh, making the animal look like it does after X amount of time lying in a field. Often, often the, the, the cuts or the the wounds or the scavenging uh, areas when when the animal bloats from uh, from the gases inside from all the grass in their stomach they'll bloat mm-hmm. um, the the cuts will stretch 
And um, then when the animal goes back down to its normal size or even, you know, shrunken even, uh, the cut areas won't won't go down as well. They'll often stay because they've been dried out and um, they'll stay um, and looking glassine and, and dark and almost like they've been burnt. Mm -hmm. um, several very good studies have been done showing how um, the incisional area is in, in, impacted or the, you know, where scavenger damage uh, occurs has been impacted by nature. And, and oftentimes, too, insects scour those lines and make them look like they're, they're burnt. And the average untrained eye doesn't know. Even a veterinarian can get fooled. The only person really trained and um, uh, in a position to make an accurate determination would be an actual veterinary pathologist. It still doesn't make sense to me what anyone would need these parts for. It, it seems like such an an effort to go through that to get these parts. Uh, well, why not raise your own? If you're doing a study, why not just raise your own somewhere on a on a farm in South America? They do. Or, yeah, they do. <laughs> so what they they just they hit their max, um, and, and then they go out and, and collect until they can you know, yeah. Re, uh, re-raise new yeah the epa does that uh, centers for disease control um offshoots of the national institute of health all the way back into the 40s uh, they've been concerned about the um the possible contamination by by uh by design of our food chain and oh. so back in the mid to late 40s they actually started thinking about uh, how we would uh, would address that that issue yeah well why not just pay the the ranchers for their cattle to say hey well, we, we need extra cattle we're doing a study you know they do they well, do do that but so uh, why not pay for more why keep keep like, well in some areas see 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 what we're discussing is not so much the animal mm -hmm. uh that's being targeted it's where the animal is in in the environment so uh, that's, okay. that's 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 so that's an important that's part decision. of the study Got yeah, it. that's that's an important distinction that that really should be made, and unfortunately, for the past oh forty years, certain in investigators, uh, in order to, I think, sensationalize and do a little bit of mystery mongering, they've uh, they've looked at about five to ten percent of the cases and used those as a as a representation for the entire phenomenon. That's why when I wrote my book, Stalking the Herd, I wanted to include. All the cases, the cases where animals have been shot by firearms, then mutilated, cases where animals um, have been found in, in helicopter act activity um, of, of un, un, unknown, uh, with unknown uh, pilots have been uh, seen in the area. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to include cases where unusual substances have been found in the cattle, everything from nicotides, um, amphetamines, barbiturates. In one case on the Sam Walton Ranch in, in, uh, in uh, you know, the Walmart guy uh, family, um, they found a, an animal that had mescaline in it. Um, huh. they've, they've had all sorts of coagulants, anticoagulants, uh, blood thinners. Uh, we've had cases where the animals appear to have, have, have had all the copper removed from the blood. Um, the, the aliens aren't responsible for those types of uh, <laughs> those types of of conditions of the animal, and so to to just kind of, in my mind, be intellectually dishonest and not take into account the full scope of of the phenomenon, and just um, concentrate on the high strange cases that feature lights, weird objects. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is is uh, is is doing the subject a, a, a great disservice that's that's why I, I felt it was important for someone to finally write the definitive book that looks at this whole thing objectively and doesn't have a theory to to try to promote or prove uh by only using part 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 of the data but what about sightings of of craft or lights um odd phenomena happening near or around these these sites where cattle mutilations take place are those just helicopter lights that are um, misunder misinterpreted. That's that's that would be the uh, uh, you know if you're looking at this uh, 
from a skeptical point of view, obviously that would be the first thing that, that would come to mind. There have been silent helicopters uh, reported. There have been military helicopters. There have been all sorts of civilian helicopters reported. Um, I had one sh- uh, sheriff say, well, I know that TV lady thinks that these things turn into, these helicopters turn into UFOs, but the the one we we shot sure didn't. He said, we we got that thing good. We, we, we would start making clanking noises and was smoking. And I'll bet you it had a hard time getting back to Fort Carson. <laughs> so, um, you know, the helicopters have actually almost been brought down. Helicopters have also fired on ranchers and, and, and law enforcement have fired fired on them. Uh, we had one case where a rancher started, you know, taking his, his hunting rifle and was shooting at the helicopter. And they started shooting back and then somebody on the ground started shooting at him. Jeez. So it, 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 there's so many cases um, that have gone, you know, water under the bridge mm-hmm. that, that have, have just – there's no way that you can use them to explain any sort of off-planet intelligence. When, whenever somebody says to me, well, I thought uh, aliens were coming and gathering genetic material so that they could hybridize their dying race, my, my stock answer was, why not pick the lock on a slaughterhouse? You can go in there, mm-hmm. sneak in there at night, and get as much genetic material as you need. Why do you have to sneak around the pastures of the world? Well, and not only just, that, not only that, but we now, as humans, we're beginning to grow organs, and in the semi near future, we will be able to grow organs of our own DNA. So when you have liver problems, right. you replace your liver, you will have your own liver. To replace it with, so it seems to right. me advanced ETs they would be able to do something similar and have their own sophisticated laboratories for this kind of stuff. Well, and and it's the same thing with alien implants. I mean, I've seen things that look exactly like a little tiny finishing nail that you would use, uh, you know, on a floor. Or I've seen what are obviously shards of glass that have been you know, calcium built up around it. If aliens were so smart and so high tech, why don't they use nanotechnology? They wouldn't need to have anything that we could spot. Um, they could have something this this the size of one of those little those little where they, the things that's tar tardophiles or whatever that the Israelis just spilled on the moon with their crash. Grids, yeah. Um, they could have you know little devices like that that size that would uh, do anything that they needed. Uh, just almost with our level of technology, so yeah. you know, there's a there's a lot of pop culture misconception around the UFO subject, around the cattle mutilation subject, around haunted site uh, investigations. Uh, you know, you could go down the list of things where the media mostly has been responsible for um, fabricating uh, educational information for people who don't know any better and they take it as gospel. And that's why, you know, it's very, very difficult for people like me at times to do our jobs properly because um, we have to, you know, climb that mountain of media-induced expectation by uh, by by the public. And, and uh, there are times when I, I just, <laughs> back in the 90s when I was trying to battle against uh, – a lot of disinformation. Um, it just got to the point where you know, then I became the story, and people were more interested in what what I was doing and what I had to say and what I thought. And it's like, well, you're you're kind of losing the forest for the trees here. <laughs> and I ended up moving because of, as soon as the Japanese tourists start taking pictures of your house, it's time time to go. <laughs> it's right. that that, it's like that, a- that was it. That was my. I, I suppose. I mean, then again, if you're you're a Hollywood person, right, you get chased by TMZ. Um, just kind of yeah. goes part and parcel with it. All right, but we're coming up to our, our first break. This has been a great conversation. I'm glad we got to get your take on cattle mutilations. There's mm-hmm. so much more to cover, and I really do want to talk about places in America where there are alleged portals and mysterious anomalies. So we'll be back after this break. Hang in there. We have that and so much more of the paranormal ilk to talk about. Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on KGRA. We'll be right back.
author Kathleen Watts, a.k.a. Thought Continuum, shares a double abduction experience in her book, Catch Me If You Can, a story of alien abduction and culprit plunder. This 1976 true life account of a close encounter in northern Utah near Hill Air Force Base. Imagine driving home from the movies with your spouse when your car suddenly stops working. And it's in that very same moment that you realize you are the only thing animated. Catch me if you can. The fifth anniversary edition with lead-in material for the upcoming release of Payback is a Glitch from award-winning author Kathleen Watts. Get your copy today. Log on to thoughtcontinuum.com. That's thoughtcontinuum.com. Is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Hi, Matt Ray with America's First News here, and I have great news for those of you who suffer with debilitating migraine headaches, maybe a loved one or your child does. Mig Relief, the nutritional migraine supplement everyone's talking about, now can be found at the vitamin shop stores nationwide and Meyer in the Midwest. For almost two decades, hundreds of thousands of migraine sufferers have benefited from Mig Relief, and thousands of neurologists and headache specialists recommend it. Why is it popular? It's drug-free and addresses the specific nutritional needs of adults and children who suffer migraines. What's even better, MigRelief comes in a formula you can take daily and one on the spot as needed. So if you get migraines, get your life back on track. Go to MIG911.com. That's MIG and the numbers 911.com. That's also where you can read the testimonials. Or head on over to your local vitamin shop store nationwide or Meyer in the Midwest. If you get migraines, do yourself a favor. Change your life with Migrelin. Every two seconds, someone needs blood. Whether it's a natural disaster or one single child suffering from illness, the American Red Cross stands ready to supply blood when it's most needed. But blood is a perishable product. Therefore, it must continuously be replenished. You can safely donate blood every 56 days. The need is constant and patients are waiting. Call your American Red Cross at 1-800-GIVE-LIFE to schedule your life-saving appointment. Please give blood today. Patients are depending on you. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. I'm Alan B. Smith, your grateful host tonight. And tonight my guest is Christopher O'Brien. And now that we've been a little schooled on his point of view from cat- on cattle mutilations, I one topic we really haven't covered much on Paranormal Now are places where portals to wherever else exist, whether it be a place like Mount Shasta where people claim UFOs are coming in and out, or Bigfoot and what have you. So, I'm I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Chris, if you had to start somewhere, the most interesting place in America where these strange interdimensional or what have you portals exist, what what is the one that really grabs your attention? Well, the the one obviously that most people have heard of is the. Um, misnamed, I must add, uh, Skinwalker Ranch um, up in the Uinta Basa 
uh, the Uinta Basin in um, central Utah, um, it's just south of the town of Fort Duchesne. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for some reason, <laughs> it just kind of, it's weird the way these things work sometimes, but I was contacted by uh, the the writer of the story that broke the thing wide open back in '96, uh, Zach Van Ack. He was writing for the the Desiree News, based out of Salt Lake City, and he had heard about this place and did this long, extensive article. And before he released it, he he talked to the uh, rancher, and the rancher asked him if there was somebody that he could talk to, so that he could be prepared for what was going to happen. And um, Zach had uh, a pretty good uh, idea of, of my work at the time, and we both had a mutual friend, and, and he thought that some of the things that I had been dealing with in Colorado were very, very similar to what Terry Sherman was dealing with up on what was later called the Gorman Ranch uh, to hide his identity. Um, so Zach called me up and said, hey, this ranch is going through this that and the other thing and boy it sure like to talk to somebody and and uh here's his number if you wouldn't mind could you give him a call so i went up there immediately i talked to him he said he really needed needed some help needed to talk to somebody i did the 450 mile trip up there the next day sat with him 104 degree <laughs> a day i'll never forget in uh, june of uh, june of 96 and um and he started telling me uh, of some of the things that were happening, including large um, portals opening up in the air um, right in front of his house and these these 40-foot triangular ships kind of wobbling through very slowly. And then they would shoot out these glowing refrigerator-sized uh, rectangular objects that would also th- – then they would shoot out these uh, blue lights that looked like softballs. But uh, we're highly um, brightly lit, shall we say? How did they move? And, um, well, <laughs> everything tended to zip around. Mm-hmm. He he said that the that usually when the when the portal opened up, it was like an aperture and a camera. He said that it was usually a different color on the other side, often orange. And um, he said that one night though, uh, it opened up at night, and he could see daylight and clouds and blue sky through the through the hole but it was it was dark um you know on his the day that this happened on his ranch so anyway this uh, large triangular ship instead of floating through carefully it came zipping through and it tried to put on its brakes but it um he, he was going too fast and he lopped off the top of a whole whole line of cottonwood trees and uh, we're talking, you know, 40, 50 feet in the air. And uh, he said, look, see down there? <laughs> so we walked down there. And sure enough, here's all the tops to his cottonwood trees that are, you know, 40 feet in the air. And all the tops have been busted off. Mm. And he said, see what I mean? And um, he said that was the last time uh, he had seen the portal open up and chips come through. And, and he figured it must be must have been a rookie driver who didn't get good instructions and came through too fast. Um, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm a believer that, that ro- rookie drivers do exist because <laughs> whatever your species may be, um, assuming you're organic, right, and you're a, a learning mind, eventually, you know, the teenagers have to take the wheel. Yeah, um, or exactly. Or science, <laughs> science students have to, you know, go into the laboratory <laughs> and experiment and, and learn. Um, so that, for me, that's... The only way I can explain away other factors, sure, environmental, radar, what have you, but that's the only reason I can explain away why UFOs would crash in the first place. Well, you know, just the the matter of fact way that he told me the story and, you know, having been a logger actually at one point uh, back when I was younger and a little bit more, um, you know, had a little bit more daring do, uh, I know how difficult it is to climb up and lop the top of a a tree off and the trees had been broken off they had not been been you know cut like with the chainsaw you could tell they've been snapped off and uh and that's virtually impossible to do um 
And, and there was, but there are no heat signatures or nothing. No, nothing like that. And, and cottonwood is, if you if you know your wood, cottonwood is a very spongy wood. That's very it, 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 you can bend it, and it's it's got a lot of uh, give to it. It's not like a hardwood that'll snap um, easily. So it, it really took a lot of force to snap those those cottonwood treetops, sure. and the timing of the of the event, which was two weeks before. Um, I could see the indications of that date by the um, amount of of time that it took, you know, for the actual leaves to die. Mm-hmm. Um, when, another thing that he showed me was all around his pasture. He said that these things would sometimes wait for the portal to open up and they'd they'd land. And um, he, he said here here and he showed me the whole sets of these triangular marks that were punched like five six inches into the soil and uh he had a um one of these guys that that uh work for the mining companies that figure out if if a piece of ground is 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 sturdy enough to to hold you know to attain the amount of um, support for you know mining equipment and stuff and he came and he did a measurement a perk test and stuff and he said that the whatever landed uh, weighed about nine tons he said, a "Figure an empty uh, uh, railroad car, um, and that's that's <laughs> pretty heavy. Um, and there were triangular marks all over his field. Now, I don't think the guy went around and and, and was able to 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 mash these these you know punctures into his his field. Um, it was obviously done when it was wet uh, or when it was dry. Rather, uh, it, it was during the." Um, the dry season, and uh, there didn't seem to be any any sort of standing moisture anywhere nearby. Um, because it was my first visit, I didn't ask to see his videos. I didn't ask to see his photographs. On my first visit, I never um, do anything except listen and, and, and take some notes. Um, generally, now I record. Back then, I didn't because um, people felt recordings, they they, they they tend to um, their answers become shorter. They don't give as much information out. If you're only writing notes, that tends to be a little bit, uh, I think, easier for people to 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 deal with. So I was uh, busy taking notes, but I thought this was going to be the the first of many visits. Um, he he was uh, in fear of his family. Mm-hmm. Um, there there was uh, several experiences that happened that uh, caused him to uh, to be uh, quite. Uh, quite alarmed and, and, and very, very nervous for the safety of his family. He wanted to sell the ranch, but he wanted to sell it to somebody or a group that would be able to figure out what the hell was going on on his ranch. Well, how, and, how, regular, uh, how regular was this? Um, it would ebb and flow in waves. Um, he had been there two years at that point, I think, and um, he had had several dozen um, events um I mean, I, I couldn't even begin to, to go into all the, the different things that um, happened there. Hunt for the Skinwalker is a book that was written by uh, uh, George Knapp and Colm Kelleher, which gives, I think, a fairly accurate um, view of, of some of the events that occurred to him. Some of the dates are wrong. Some of the details are a little skewed based on what I, I was told. But I think they did a pretty darn good job getting it all down. And um, and it's a, a extremely popular book, and of course now there's going to be a TV show about the place. There's been a documentary that, that was qu- frankly quite awful um, that was produced last you know, this last year, and um, there's other there's a History Channel show I believe that's going to be uh, covering the ranch and the new owners. The ranch was sold to a rich uh, multi billionaire who um, uh, Robert Bigelow. Who spent millions of dollars with scientists, with scientific teams up there and security forces, uh, attempting to chase the stuff down? And all it did was play with them. Uh, it was very trickster-like and and did not allow them to uh, gain replicable data, the type of stuff that scientists uh, lust after, repeatable experiences, that sort of thing, uh, that they could compare. And and they they pretty much. Uh, uh, we're just left you know, with various body parts in their hands. Um, <laughs> um, I meant that as a joke. Um, 
there were cattle mutilations. Anytime they would dig on the property, it seems that would stir things up. Oftentimes they would hear voices in the air. Sometimes they would hear uh, sounds underneath the ground. Uh, there was a cattle mutilation that occurred to a small calf while the rancher and his wife were in the field uh, just some hundreds of yards away in broad daylight in the morning. Um, they put the ear tag on the calf, gave it a shot, went to the next uh, mama and baby and did the same thing and came back 10, 15 minutes later, uh, 20 minutes maybe. Um, the first calf was, was totally eviscerated, not a drop of blood. Internal organs were gone. Front leg was gone. Uh, it was an awful, awful looking scene. They had a veterinary pathologist and a microbiologist on a private jet up there within three hours. They found teeth marks. They found uh, cutting marks like with a knife. And they found um, evidence of um, some sort of surgical activity on the animal, as well as <laughs> I guess the vet got hungry and started gnawing on one of the bones or something. Because they also found teeth marks, so that that he asked me, you know, which case I would I would select that particular place because it is so location specific um, would get my my uh, my vote for the for the most compelling um, single case. Um, I know of a portal in Colorado that I've been able to ID it down to about a hundred about a hundred uh, foot diameter circle. I've had amazing things happen there. The people that live around that uh, that particular spot. Um, well, closest. You know, let's let's talk more about that in a second. But I, I do want to get your take on uh, Robert Bigelow. So he's been behind a lot of investigations for quite some time. Um, obviously involved in the aerospace industry as well. Political ties like Harry Reid to get the um, advanced aerospace threat identification program up and running as well. He was an influence there, um, clearly, since he received uh, funding from that project. Do you ever do you ever wonder if there's there's more to Robert Bigelow than just a curious mind using his money towards uh, finding answers? Or, or do you think there's something else going on there that I just can't put my finger on? Well, you know, unfortunately, he doesn't uh, particularly care for journalists, as I'm I'm known around there. Oh, he's a journalist. Of course, they forget that I, you know, have worked with scientists and and done actual scientific work with protocols out in the field. But I have not had the chance uh, to speak with him. Through the grapevine, I've heard that um, he lost his son um, who died. And one of the reasons why he's so into this is he's trying to figure out a way to contact him. That's one story I've heard. Another story I've heard is that he really wants to crack the, uh, you know, the diagnostic propulsion end of this so that he can, uh, um, you know, come up with the next uh, way to power uh, various types of uh, rockets, uh, spacecraft, whatever. Sure. Um, his um, his business now, Bigelow Aerospace, um, is providing modules for the uh, – for the um, space station and uh, their inflatable modules that have now passed the test. So um, I think they're, they're going to be used by, by NASA. He himself has two floating space stations. He's the only individual, uh, private individual on, on Earth that has his own, not one, but two uh, space stations. So he's, he's a very enigmatic guy. Uh, He's, uh, I, I, you got to admire him. He's put millions and millions of dollars into research and investigation of um, not one, not two, but a, a number of, of uh, spots where strange activity is said to occur. Um, for a while, he had a, a, uh, a relationship with the Mutual UFO Network where he was funding the START team uh, that would go. You know, on a minute's notice, kind of like a rapid response team that would go to places where where um, activity was occurring. Um, this kind of stuff t- takes a lot of dough, and when you put your money where your mouth is in this realm, and you still are able to maintain uh, some sort of political power and viability, and uh, and maintain 
your reputation instead of becoming a laughing stock. You got to hand it to the guy. He's the first one and only one that's been able to do that. So, so Bigelow, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, um, I had lots of problems with him with his secrecy and hiding everything and hoarding all his data. But as time has gone on, he has he has been as forthcoming as I think he thinks he should be, and he has released quite a number of reports and. Uh, and I recommend everybody go and go in the Wayback Machine and grab the NIDS, the NIDS uh, reports, National Institute of Discovery Sciences. Um, and there's some very good ones in there that uh, have to do with the catamulation uh, mystery, have to do with material, um, the breakdown of material ID. Um, they're working on um, supposedly alien artifacts and you know, supposedly um, non-terrestrial metals and things. Sure, so, everybody's just waiting with bated breath for that too. Right, and and you know the chances of of, of anything coming from that, uh, I think, are pretty slim. They may announce uh, maybe some you know ingredients that are in composite uh, mm-hmm. uh, materials and that sort of thing, but I I don't. Unless they really get into major, major budgets and 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 the government gets involved and it gets appropriated by the Defense Department, then um, chances are um, it's going to take that kind of a scientific effort to really, uh, you know, uh, take it to the, take it to the nth degree. But well, but think- the fact that he's doing it is great. I mean, it really. Oh is. yeah, obviously it, it's stirring the waters, and we're um, hopefully getting some things done. And I, I really do appreciate, you know, you can think what you want about the actual efficacy of proving or disproving whether there are ET visitations to Earth or not. Um, but To The Stars Academy has done a great marketing job. And I think that that's why they've been so successful. Um, obviously, they have some big names to go with it. But but marketing is important. I mean, when you approach a subject yeah. like this, because so long it's been laughed at, it's it's been a side joke, and you made this observation about Robert Bigelow that he's become a little bit more open as time goes on. Now, of course, that could be age, and I'm just speculating here, but it could be that because society as a whole is becoming more open and and receptive, that maybe he feels more comfortable being yeah. Spoken yeah, it's, it's a good it's a good point. I think that's uh, a point well taken. I think uh, there, there there does seem to be almost a side by side relationship. The more open he's become, mm-hmm. is has been you know right alongside people becoming more open in in, in the culture. Um, but again, like I said, he does have quite a bit of uh, political power um, and has been able to parlay that power into you know half billion dollar contracts so so the guy has has his proverbial act together and it's it's good to see an individual with that kind of clout um putting his money where his mouth is and actually doing doing uh uh the job that the government is probably also doing but doing it in the public sector uh so that at least we have the potential to find out exactly what we're dealing with uh, with some of these um, exotic materials and and some of the capabilities of of these crafts. Um, I do think that um, that Skinwalker, uh, which I, I hate that name because it's so inaccurate. Um, I, I do think that that is a um, it is a special place. It's not the only special place around, but it, it's the one that that got the most attention and, and has, um, you know, it's, it's presence and, uh, it's notoriety is leaked out into the public. And so the main problem they have up there now is all the look, looky loos coming in and flying drones over the place or, you know, setting off their dogs or, you know, just bugging the heck out of the people that are up there trying to do work. It's like a lot of kids, you know, Hey, let's go up to Skinwalker and get a couple cases of Miller, and uh, let's go up there and see if we can see one of them wolf things. Um, there's a lot of that, a um, lot, lot of you know party, party atmosphere. Um, 
that's not how the work gets done. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I haven't been to some pretty, uh, I would say some pretty spooky spots over the years. Uh, you know, you, you got to have a bit of a game face on. You might be dealing with something that you did not want to deal with. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, curiosity killed the cat, right? I mean, it's, but there's so many things that we are fascinated by and we want the answers to, um, but we may not like what we find, right? Um, yeah. also, I would like to, to also add that with the advance of science and space exploration as we, as we know it, and all the high-tech uh, propulsion systems that are in development right now, I think it's fair to say that in the next 50 years, we will we could quite possibly really be a spacefaring species. And with that in mind, perhaps that is one of the reasons why the, the, the government or people in the higher ups are a little bit more loose lipped about this subject because eventually they, they have to let the cat out of the bag. Um, excuse me for all the cat metaphors tonight, but because eventually we will get out to space. The private sector is developing propulsion systems that will not be able to be uh, hidden anymore away from the public. So I guess their backs up against the wall is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think so. It, it just seems weird that, you know, 50 years ago we went to the moon and we only returned just a handful of times. Uh you know, why, why, why have we been dead in the water for over 40 years, 45 years? We have really not done anything in terms of manned space flight, uh, very little. And the only things that we've done is sent probes out there. Um, I'm, you know, some people say, oh, we're quarantined. We've been told that we're not allowed off the earth yet and, and all this, uh, which, you know, maybe sounds good in a, a sci-fi movie or something, but... Um, it just it just seems strange to me that you know we made such a concerted effort to get out there, and then we just you know the Arabs nationalized their <laughs> their gas, and we went into a recession. Oh, that that was it. You know, the Vietnam War probably uh, had a little something to do with it too. We spent a lot of money over there, and you know the. Three trillion dollars that we spent in Iraq. I mean, we could already be to Mars, <laughs> right? Well, look, I mean, the, of course, in science, there's much that we learned, but I, I do think that what happened was also psychologically. Once we got to the moon and we went, we went there twice. I think it was no longer the next exciting thing, and I think that had NASA really. Um, put their foot on the pedal and got the funding from it too, of course, uh, to go to Mars and actually, you know, work, you know, ha had a shorter time period to get there. Um, perhaps there would have been more public interest, but the waning public interest defunded. And then of course, you know, so it was like, uh, you know, the snake chasing its tail there and, and it just fed, you know, feedback loop and, the, and eventually, um, you know, funding just went down, 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 down. I do think, though, that if we had gone just once or twice to the moon and then immediately turned our direction to Mars, um, we may have actually been on Mars by now. But we are we are coming up to the break. Sorry to, to cut you off there, Chris. Um, I And I'm really excited. I want to find out your take oh, – not your take, your story about the Colorado Circle portal and what's okay. going on the other side of that portal for us. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now. And as a friendly reminder, in the last half an hour, call-ins will now be available to you all as we roll out the new HD toll-free phone line sponsored by the Paranormal Radio app. So add this number to your mobile phone so you can use us, call us hands-free at 85KGRA-LIVE. That's 855-472-5483. Listen for your cue to call and pose your questions to the guest or myself, and um, we'll get you on the air and you can ask Chris all those Crazy questions you have. Alan B. Smith will be right back.
where will you be this September 13th through the 15th? If you are a critical thinker seeking answers to questions like, What are aliens? Are they demons or visitors from other worlds? Do they have an agenda? And if so, how do we stop them from interfering in our lives? Then the place you need to be is Branson, Missouri, inside the Mansion Theater, as Gen 6 Productions presents The True Legends Answering the Alien Question Conference 2019. Featuring writer, explorer, and filmmaker Timothy Alberino, author, lecturer, and filmmaker L.A. Marzulli. Is our planet being prepared for reseeding by non-Earth entities? Find out from publisher Mike Adams, UFO investigator Chase Kletzky, investigative reporter George Knapp, world-renowned researcher and author Steve Quayle, and many more. Reserve your seats or order live streaming now at gen6.com. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. You're listening to the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Feeling sluggish, bloated, gassy, and, well, you know, want some relief? Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Our unique blend of all-natural herbs go to work on your digestive tract, giving you, ah. So before you, ugh, try our super strength formula. It does a great job removing intruders that jack you up. Thousands of people use Life Change Tea every month. So try it because you're going to love the way you feel. And here's a little pick-me-up. Order now and receive 10% off your first order by entering in 10 today in the coupon code. That's 10 today in the coupon code. Go to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Enter 10 today in the coupon code for your 10% discount. Wow, feeling good never felt so good. Get some tea love at GetTheTea.com. Change in America, one tea bag at a time. You wanted to see me? Yes, please, have a seat. So here's the thing. When this company brought you on, we took a chance on you. You didn't have that four-year college degree we typically look for. Right. But we gave you a shot anyway. And since then, you've worked incredibly hard and given it your all. Thanks. You've been an important asset to the team, but... I don't think you can be an intern here anymore. We want to hire you. You're, you're serious? Absolutely. Find your next great employee. Introduce yourself to the grads of life. Who are they? Talent worth knowing about. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. I won't let you down. I know. Don't miss out on a resource many innovative companies have already discovered. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. This is Richard Dolan, and I want to brag for just a second about the incredible authors I publish under Richard Dolan Press. Some of the most innovative and well-researched books in the field of UFOs and beyond that you'll find anywhere in the world. Incredible UFO encounters, the cover-up, the experiences by ordinary people, Russian UFOs, psychic phenomena, consciousness, synchronicities, and owls. Yeah, it's all there, and it's all fascinating reading because I would never publish a book that isn't. To learn more, go to richarddolanpress.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics, KGRARadio.com. Conclusion 
illusions I don't want to find. Welcome back to Paranormal Now on KGRA Live every Tuesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To find out more about this show, you can just go to paranormalnow.net or on Instagram at Paranormal Now. And of course, on Facebook, Paranormal Now Radio. And for this show and all other shows on the KGRA Network, just go to KGRA Radio. All right. Our guest. Christopher O'Brien is going to take us through a passage of portals and we're going to start in a place called Colorado, USA. Chris, take us away. Well, I lived in uh, the San Luis Valley, which is the largest Alpine Valley in the world um, from 1989 to 2002. And during that time, I, you know, when I first moved there, I I kind of knew that things that had been pretty freaky in the past. There had been a celebrated uh, mutilation case back in the early uh, in the mid seventies or uh, mid sixties, rather. Um, the case of Snippy the horse considered the first uh, case of that type, and um, I knew during the time period uh, in the sixties, sixty six, seven, eight, nine, that there had been hundreds and hundreds of UFO sightings. But when I moved there. I thought all that stuff was ancient history. I, I I didn't really, I couldn't imagine that things were still going on. And uh, slowly I started experiencing weird aerial anomalies. I started hearing stories from other people that had seen weird things. And and so I started kind of jotting, jotting things down and kind of, you know, half keeping track of some of the things I was hearing. Not expecting to do anything with it, but just uh, just kind of, you know, log it in case something important happened. I would have, you know, additional information. I was writing for my little town newspaper um, in 92, and and uh, two huge 100-foot ovals came down the first weekend of December and freaked a lot of people out in the town. I The town I was in was only about 200 people. Chris, did you say, and, uh, did you say ovals? Yes, uh, hundred foot ovals, glowing white, kind of a slightly off white. They came down out of the Sangre de Cristos, which ran all the way um, about a hundred miles um, past my house. Uh, we were right in the foothills of them, and the Sangres are. I had three or four fourteen thousand foot mountains right behind my house, uh, so. Um, they went out uh, over the valley, and then one took off to the west, and one took off to the south. So I wasn't there. I was um, actually gigging with my band that weekend, so I missed out on all the fun. But I had a New Year's Eve party, you know, months the end of the month, and it's it seemed like everywhere I went in the party, everyone was talking about these sightings. So I figured, well, man, a lot of people saw these things. Maybe I'll write an article about it. And so I, I did. I had a, a couple of weeks to, to get my article in. And uh, within a week, I knew I had uncovered uh, enough st- information and documented reports and newspaper articles and, you know, met sheriffs and, and you know, ex-military and astronomer. I had enough material to, <laughs> to do a book. And so my article, instead of being 500 pay, uh, words, like she asked, was 1,500 words. And it got picked up by all the wire services, um, AP, UPI, Reuters, and it went around the world. And within two months, I was on Unsolved Mysteries. So it was kind of weird the way the whole thing began, but I took it very seriously. And I, I took copious notes and was very, very um, methodical um, and very determined to do the um, actual login of information uh, correctly and and with diligence and in a way that, that was unassailable. And I noticed uh, probably about three years in, I noticed that there seemed to be areas that um, tended to have more stuff going on. And one of those was fairly near my house. And, you know, I was interviewing the people in this one area you have to imagine that it's a huge valley. It's 160 miles long, 70 miles wide, totally surrounded by mountains. There's one person for every seven square miles. Uh, it's an immense place. It was a, an hour just to get to the supermarket or hospital or 
um, to the you know, movie theater, and then an hour back. I mean, that's <laughs> that's pretty remote, and um, beautiful, beautiful location, and and um, so I I started poking around, and I was asking uh, the people around this one area, you know, some about some of the stuff that they were seeing, and and I was. They were telling me everything from trooping fairies to to weird semi uh, translucent uh, being these weird a- animal type things that would sl- slither through the air about a foot off the ground. Um, every, every every sort of of kind of it sounds like a like a fantasy book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if I hadn't known these people. Um, I would have thought that they, you know, either a they were doing too many drugs, or b they needed some serious um, mental health um, help, or c they've been living in this <laughs> high high and lonesome place for too long and they needed to get down to the off the hill into the city. But I knew I knew everybody. In fact, one of the guys is a world class keyboard player. Who uh, you know did the theme for Star Trek? Did the, the original Star Trek? Did the theme for the original Twilight Zone? Donna Reed, mm-hmm. The Untouchables. Uh, I mean, the guy was a a who's who uh, musician with the, you know, seventeen patents. He had patented the electronic guitar. I mean, he was the he was the main chief uh, um, consultant for Korg and, and Roland. And, uh, you know, if this guy tells me that the eight trooping fairies went, came through his closed door, marched across his studio, and they all went out the back, the back wall. And before the last one went out, it turned around and gave him a dirty look. Uh, <laughs> what are you going to tell the guy that he's full of, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm going to listen to him and I'm going to write all this stuff down. And uh, and that was just one of over a hundred events that he that he um, experienced, and he happened to be in the house closest to this particular um, spot that I'm going to describe. Mm-hmm. I started, um, you know, zeroing in on it. It took me about a year to figure out the exact spot, but I know I know for a fact that there's a spot that I can go to and have. Strange stuff happened to me. I photographed uh, wiggling light worms. I photographed blazing uh, colored uh, round orbs, um, green colored. Um, I've had all sorts of strange kind of mental experiences there where you go in there and voices are talking to you. And um, there's obviously this was an ancient, ancient Native American site. In fact, Within 20 miles of this spot are some of the earliest known uh, remains of humans in North America, uh, sitting there in conjunction with mastodon kills. Um, so this is an area that's been shared by three major groups of Indians, uh, three major, uh, you know, the Great Basin Indians, the Great Plains Indians, mm-hmm. and the Southwest Western Indians all overlapped on this one valley. And it's the only spot in North America that this is the, this happened, and uh, none of them would live there uh, full full time. But they all agreed not to have any any human on human fighting while they were there. And I guess I wouldn't want to live there either because it can get twenty thirty below, and you know, be pretty nasty in the winter time. And that would that would kind of ruin the <laughs> ruin my day. Uh, hold 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 on one second, okay? All right. <laughs> Looks like we got some. Some interference. Someone doesn't want the story to be told. Chris, you still there? Oh, it looks like Chris stepped away. Well, you know, on one, one second. Yep, yep. That's all right. He's got to take care of some some business. That's fine. Um, I have personally experienced something like I would consider near a portal. It was actually close to Mount Shasta, and uh, we had an experience that could sort of just. Defies explanation. Where, and where near Mount there, Shasta? There was a. Uh, it was on uh, Gilliland's ranch, and it was at nighttime. We were tenting. That's Mount and, Adams. Oh, Mount Adams. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, and we, <laughs> something was stalking. 
I'll just put it that way. And then when I went to check on it, there, there was nothing there. Uh, it, it was probably the most eeriest experience I've ever had. Um, and you're right, Mount St. Adams and, or Mount Adams. And at nighttime, people claim to see lights there and it's sort of like flickering or sparkling. And, and that's a portal as well. In, in this place, are there are there signatures that you can recognize if something is coming in and out of a portal? Yeah, when they um, come up and stand right in your face, barely invisible, and challenge you if you don't uh, show them respect and kind of ease into the site. Yeah. If you barge into the site, you uh, you are asked to leave. <laughs> asked to leave. Yeah. In uh, fact, I, I I went there with one of the world's most accomplished, famous uh, paranormal investigators who we sadly just lost a month ago, uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, mm. um, who was a bit of a mentor of mine. And I took her on a tour of the San Luis Valley, and we, we were having dinner and a couple of glasses of wine, and uh, we were headed back uh, to the house where we were staying. I said, oh, i got to take you to this this place that I've ID'd as a portal and we stopped and we just barged right in, uh, stupidly. And, um, we both experienced the exact same thing Two figures. Well, they didn't walk or run. They, they, they flew across the, the pasture and ended up right in our faces. Something, a third thing went around and was behind us. And, uh, we both, she grabbed my hand, and, and we both looked at each other and said, we better leave. I, I mean, we both said it, like, simultaneously, <laughs> and we left. And when we got, you know, it was five minutes from the house, and when we got back to the house, um, Rosemary said, oh, my God, that was that was really something. And we both kind of described, or we wrote down, what each of us had experienced and then compared notes. And we both experienced the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And then she goes, well, I hope whatever that was didn't follow us home. And a plant start that was in one of those red beer cups was on the windowsill. It leapt. I mean, it didn't fall. It leapt out into the room. (laughs) Oh man. The the owner of the house was not happy. (laughs) Yeah. No, I wouldn't be happy either. Um, (laughs) And two experienced paranormal investigators getting yeah. creeped out like that. That has to be a testament yeah. to something. Well, we weren't really creeped out. We were more excited than anything. Uh, I mean, we weren't frightened or anything. Oh, but, only, but, I've only been in one place where I've been frightened, and that was the, that was the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas. Mm-hmm. I, will, I will never set foot back in that basement. Wait, what happened in the Sally House? Um, something was coming up out of the floor and it was coming real slow. It was huge. We don't know. I don't know what it was. My back was to it. I was filming uh, Amy Allen and, mm-hmm. and the, the Pickmans who had lived there. Uh, it's the first time they'd been back in five years. The house had been abandoned. And because I'm holding the shot, I couldn't turn around to see what I could feel was coming up through the floor right behind me. And, um, as it got to me, I could feel the cold, and then I felt look. It felt like a hand coming in my back, and very gently grasping a hold of my heart with an ice cold hand, and then slowly starting to squeeze. <laughs> and uh, if Amy hadn't said at that moment, "We are in danger. We've got to get out of here," I, I would have split. I would have. I, I. I would have broke the shot and. And just ran out. But since she said that, I, man, I was I was out of there so fast. The three of them got sick for two weeks, and um, I, I was lucky. I for some reason it just affected me for about. I was totally drained of energy for about twenty minutes, half hour. Wow. And uh, there was nothing uh, like a gas or in the air that could explain no sickness feelings or no, no, no. It was that was the real deal. Uh, I really, I, I've never felt that or anything similar actually ever. Do you, do you really think that you in your mental state can prevent something from following you? You know, if, if you have the right mental resolve. 
I don't. I think you have to be uh, even more emphatic. I think you have to use tools. I think you have to use, um, dare I say, uh, ritual protection ritual. Um, I, I think there are certain things that uh, just don't won't take no for an answer, and um, and it really doesn't matter what you do; they'll follow you home unless you are proactive and stop them from doing that. You know, someone very close to me sent me a message today. And um, it describes the histories of candles on birthday cakes. Um, it says the lit candles on the cake represented the glow of the moon and the smoke from the candles carried their prayers and wishes to the gods who lived in the skies. Some scholars believe the tradition actually started in Germany, where a candle was supposedly placed on the cake to represent the light of life. So these are the sort of rituals that people have been using throughout time but we are also a culture that doubts and we d- doubt superstition, right? So when you're doing these kind of rituals, how do you know something isn't just a superstition and something that actually works? Um, because I've been highly trained in the Western esoteric tradition, mm-hmm. the Western esoteric tradition, um, which can involve everything from hermeticism, Gnosticism, um, Golden Dawn magic, uh, various uh, types of belief systems that are pretty much offshoots of uh, of what is commonly referred to as Egyptian high magic. Um, various other offshoots of the Rosicrucians, uh, the Temp- Templars, the uh, Freemasonry, um, different types of pagan beliefs. Um, and so then I'm there's... Like- on my birthday, I should be doing Egyptian high magic instead of blowing out <laughs> candles? Well, um, you know, again, I think it's just a way to, for the person whose uh, birthday it is, if they're sick, to, to make everybody sick by blowing all over their cake. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. All I know is what, what works for me. Um, I don't um, espouse any sort of uh, belief systems around around these things, but I'll tell you, there have been some some haunted sites, massacre sites, other other places that I've been to, that um, even doing a cleansing ritual, even doing a blessing ritual, even doing protection rituals, I'm still I still feel sticky when I leave. Mm-hmm. But compared to how I'd feel if I if I didn't do it, um, well, it's just a lot more comfortable. Could you compare that sense of sticky feeling that that eventually drips away to you know, excessive physical exertion where, you know, your body just sort of repairs naturally and then you get back to your normal state again. Is it something like well, that? Well, maybe sticky isn't the right word. I just feel like I'm I'm not – like I'm unclean mm-hmm. and, and that I need, you know, to take a psychic shower. <laughs> like a psychic detox. Exactly. Well, I don't know about detox, but – but just, just you know, scrape me down. Uh-huh. Uh, let's put it that way. And you know, I, it's very rare that I have to whip whip some of that knowledge out. Of course, I I was into all that stuff, you know, years and years ago. I, I'm I'm not a practicing magician. I don't I don't routinely do um, that type of work. Although I think a lot of the things I do in my everyday life um, is kind of automatically incorporate some of that, uh, especially around people that, you know, I, I do protection around people in public that I, I feel are, um, you know, potentially not nice people. Um, so when you know you're going to meet certain people in advance, you'll perform some something, some ritual to to protect yourself. If I go to a particular place, yeah. Um, um, there have been a number, and this again was through the uh, 2005 through 2010, 11. Uh, I was working for a video company, and uh, we were doing quite a bit of um, all around the country. We were running around uh, visiting, you know, famous haunted sites and some not so famous, and uh, I just um, I felt that that it was imperative to, uh, you know, to try to as best I can. can uh, become as pristine and as neutral as possible because oftentimes it's stripping away 
your own preconceptions. It's stripping away your own fears. It's stripping away um, your own um, um, prejudices, really, before you go into a place. And 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 the protection, you know, it's it's a fine line between protection and 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 becoming a uh, putting up a barrier uh, to having a, an experience. And I find that sometimes when people go into fear, that that, that, that locks them up. Uh, in a way that 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 doesn't allow for a uh, a possible um, you know something to happen an interaction, and so it's a fine line. And uh, like I said, I mean I've been in so many situations. I've interviewed thousands of people. I've been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of locations. Um, you know, I've, I've just pretty much uh, <laughs> been there, done that, and help design the t-shirt factory in many ways. Um, that, that's, that's great. Cause even if you don't get all the answers that you're, you're looking for, you're living, right? Well, yeah, I had, I was in a place that, uh, you know, I put 300,000 miles on my, my truck in six years. Uh, um, some of that was gigging, but uh, yeah. a lot of it was investigative. Yeah. And I love a good road trip. There's just, there's something ab- about it that yeah that sense of, little discoveries along the way or maybe the occasional surprise, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not the ghosts. It's not the, the aliens. It's not the, uh, it's the, in the between witches. Things. It's, it's, it's the people that scare me. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. And you're not the only paranormal investigator that has asserted that same belief. <laughs> um, so everyone listening, the phone lines are now open. If you'd like to ask Chris, your questions about anything we've been speaking about tonight, Call 85-KGRA-LIVE. That's the Paranormal Radio app hotline number, 855-472-5483. Wait for your cue, and then I'll bring you in. Uh, Chris, do you think, and speaking about all this and, and these human encounters, do you subscribe to this whole energy vampire theory, or is that just psychology? It's both. I mean, I've been around people that just suck my energy dry. Yeah, I mean, and uh, I do. I do think that uh, that there are people that just, by nature, you know, by their very nature, they just they just do that. Um, uh, I've never never been ar- or unconsciously. Well, I was just going to say, I don't think a lot of them do it consciously. I think it's just their, their, the type of personality they are, the type of person um, that they are. And they're, they just, um, it's a combination of, of, you know, this kind of weird, vicarious um, sense where their lives maybe aren't as exciting um, as they'd like them to be. And so they kind of, they glom on to, to somebody else's life to try to, bolster their own um feelings of adequacy and feelings of uh of belonging and feelings of uh right. accomplishment so you, I, I i know that there are people like that because i've been around them do you think that our culture where there are more and more people that are isolated and lack that real human connection um not because there's a lack of human beings around them but it's easier to just stay home and communicate via devices, gaming platforms, yeah, um, binging, yeah, yeah and, and and so there's more people who, when they're around other people, are in need of some connection, and they don't know how to to get it. They don't know how to behave necessarily. They're insecure, and so they they kind of drain that energy subconsciously. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the problems that we have with the high tech era. When I was a kid, you know, I was out riding my bike, playing basketball. Um, you know, there there was none of this politically correct stuff that we had to deal with. I mean, you know, our jungle gyms and stuff. If you fell from the top, you could you could die. So you know, I think now kids kids back then were tougher. They they had a lot more um, courage. Um, they tended to to play rougher, to be rougher. Now everything is so pussyfooting around that kids really don't have the opportunity to take the kind of risks 
um, that we took. And so what, what do they do? They disappear into their, into their video games. They disappear into, um, you know, their devices. Back when there were no, no devices and there were no video games, we had, you know, I, I had an Erector set, Lincoln Logs, and uh, um, an Etch-A-Sketch, you know, and a Spirograph. That's mm-hmm. all I had. And that got boring real quick. So we went out and we built tree forts 100 feet in the air. Um, we built underground <laughs> forts that if they collapse would probably yeah. suffocated us. Yeah. Play play manhunt late into the night, you know, when, when you're not supposed yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there was no cell phone. Yeah. There was no, hey, get home. No. I just, no. My dad's super loud whistle to echo down the street. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. oh, time to go home. Yeah, exactly. Or get home before the street lights come on. Right, right. Yeah, that was exactly. another one. So, yeah. and and also that you know, it's funny that you say that because that that instills a certain amount, I think, of independence as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. But then again, there are so many young people now that are creating in the virtual world, and obviously, there's a lot of protests going on too. So there are right. there are proactive young people. And there's a real upside to all the technology. Man, are you kidding? To have a computer when I was a kid, to have a video game when I was a kid, that was that that was that would have been so far beyond my wildest dreams. Um uh, I, I think kids today don't realize how, how lucky they are. Um, you know, that they they have such wonderful technology and they know how to use it. Whenever I have a problem with, you know, trying to figure out something on my phone. Um, I just look for the nearest ten year old. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they go, Oh, you do this. It's like Damn. Do it faster than you. Yep. <laughs> faster than me. They do I, I don't even know I, my 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 flip thing, you know, where you flip it sideways and the image goes sideways. Mm-hmm. For about two or three months I couldn't figure out how the heck to get the thing to work and then you know, a little nine year old goes, Oh, you just hit this button and tweak, there it is. Yeah. God. No, it's funny, you know, watching uh my nieces, when they're you know particularly younger, figuring things out extraordinarily fast on devices that you know. But then again, I'm I'm from a generation that's not it's not that far off because I grew up with right. home video game devices and um I you know I grew up with cell phones and text messages and then you know as things became more complicated you know I'm much more of a, a full grown adult now but I am just old enough that I remember the right. times before before all that. Was right. inundated our lives, you know, and that's why I love shows like Stranger Things, um, because I think I think what shows express really well, and I think this is what people who are fascinated with the paranormal actually appreciate, is the the space that you have, the space and time between, because um, there are not so many distractions. And when right. you're going out into the field, right, and you're looking for 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 ghosts or UFOs or, or what have you, cryptids. It's forcing you to be a bit more mindful of where you are, what you're doing, focus on the, the quietness, you know, focus on silence and listening. Yeah, good point. And I think those are things that I took for granted growing up with as a kid. Yeah. Oh. And and now it's it's like there's so much going on in between that yeah. sometimes I really don't. I feel like oh man, I need to take a breath. You know, I'll take. You know, every once in a while, I'm like, I need to take a, a half day or a full day off of Facebook, you know? Right. <laughs> well, I think you brought up a very good point that, uh, that you know, abs- there is no such thing as absolute silence unless you're in space. However, um, silence is a very, very important ingredient that doesn't get get enough attention in in the investigator world, the investigator community. Silence is really important because silence has all sorts of things going on in it. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that, you know, if I'm in a, in a training situation or I'm, I'm, I'm giving people some rules of thumb to think about, one of the things that I always tell them is when in doubt, just keep everything quiet and, and just, just listen to the silence because mm-hmm. inevitably it'll tell you what to do. Yeah. All right. So we're in the last half hour here. If you want to call in and ask Chris your questions, Call 855-472-5483 and ask us whatever is on your mind. Chris, I got a little um, mixed up in my head when with 
you were with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Was that in Colorado? Yeah, it was in that uh, 100-yard circle. In the 100-yard circle. Okay. All right. So tell us more about what took place as you investigated more. Well, you know, again, there's I <laughs> the first house I lived in <laughs> when I moved there. It, it was just a classic example of my luck. You know, I, I move into this. It was a land scam originally back in the 70s. And they were building these houses with no insulation, setting them on railroad ties. They didn't even have foundations. And these poor people would try to live in the wintertime. And, and, you know, I mean, it was like with no insulation and 20 below, man, you're putting a lot of wood through that wood stove. And uh, I was in one of those types, types of houses. And uh, it had a, you know, it's like a real severe A-frame with a real, like the letter A-shaped house. And. During the summer, the upstairs bedroom turned into an absolute furnace. You couldn't even go up there. And then uh, the the two bedrooms downstairs were were nice. And then during the winter, the upstairs room was always nice and toasty, and the bottom rooms were cold. So, so we were downstairs. This is about a month after I'd moved in, and there was no there was nothing upstairs. It's just a bed sitting in there, right? And there's a little half bathroom up there and a little balcony. And I heard I was there. My friend and uh, his wife had invited me and my girlfriend to stay there to see if we liked the uh, area. And so we're down in the, the you know guest bedroom downstairs. And I I woke up in the middle of the night and I heard this boom, 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 boom. And then it turned around and and it came walking, you know, marching back. I mean, loud booming, like somebody in army boots marching upstairs. And my roommate um, liked to march around in his army boots naked, which is a little disconcerting um, uh, during the day. But um, I thought he was upstairs marching in the house at 3 in the morning. So I went through the kitchen. I, I could still hear it. I went out into the living rooms, could still hear it. Went up the, the open stairs uh, to the, to the you know, top floor. There was a little outside kind of office area before the bedroom door. I could still hear hear whoever it was. I opened the door expecting to, to see him naked in his army boots, and there was nothing. I thought, what the hell is that? I mean, what could that have been? I, I kind of you know boomed on the floor, and I couldn't even make that noise. And, and so I just thought, geez, that's weird. And I thought maybe I was dreaming it. And so I went back downstairs. The second hit, my head hit the pillow, boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Um, I woke, you know, next morning, I, I just put the pillow over my head and just tried to go to sleep. And uh, the next morning, uh, Roland, my friend, goes, oh, you heard the ghost. I said, what do you mean ghost? And he goes, yeah, there's been just weird stuff happens around here. I said, okay. And um, so anyway, they ended up moving and uh, left the house to us. So we were renting it. And um, in the, in the wintertime, I woke up one night and we were, you know, upstairs at this point in the the upstairs. And because uh, it was nice and warm up there. And I saw this roiling ball of orange light right in the right up by the ceiling where the, the A-frame came together above the chandelier. Even and I thought. I instantly thought that the, the, the chimney was on fire, that the snow outside was reflecting the light inside. So I raced downstairs, couldn't smell any smoke, went outside, chimney looked fine, went around to the back of the house. There was no glow anywhere. Came back inside, got into bed, you know, turned the light out. And as soon as my eyes got adjusted to the dark, there's the roiling orange ball. <laughs> my girlfriend said, yeah, I've been watching it the whole time. And so I said, okay, you know, now, now I got to do something. So I went and I searched the history of the house, and I found out that this guy named Mr. Douglas, who was about 350 pounds, um, had, had uh, built and moved into the house. And um, unfortunately, one day he was up taking a dump on the uh, upstairs uh, commode there, and uh, had a massive heart attack and died uh, naked on the toilet. And he, 
he kind of fell between the toilet and the sink. And so when his wife finally found him, uh, many, I guess he used to hang out in there a lot or something because she didn't find him right away. And she called the EMTs and they literally had to tear out the sink to get him out of there. And then they couldn't even get him through the door. And so they had to kind of, you know, wedge him through the door and bounce him down the stairs. It was just awful. And one of the guys I saw on the the report form that one of the guys was Fred Lipscomb, my, my friend there, who I who I'd met, who was, you know, was still on the EMTs. And he goes, Oh, I remember that was my very first EMT run. He said, Man, that was <laughs> what a way to start. So you know, I'm getting all this information. I'm thinking, wow, okay, that's Mr. Douglas. Because it sure sounds like a 350-pound guy when he marches, you know. And so um, we end up moving out of that house because we found a much better house. Um, and uh, we ended, you know, that we were going to buy instead of rent. And uh, and we were at the, the local, um, um, we have 4th of July party there every year. And have this silly parade. And so we were on a parade and somebody goes, oh, meet Ed and Nancy Valco. They moved into the house you were in. And I said, oh, have you guys met Mr. Douglas yet? And they said, what do you mean? I said, he's this big old guy that built the house that died on the toilet upstairs. And they both freaked because they just moved in mm. and they put they put a brand new toilet seat on there with <laughs> the papers still on it. And when they went upstairs to put all the stuff in the in the cabinet, the toilet seat was broken. I mean, cracked on both sides. <laughs> Brand <That's> new. So- <laughs> I love that story. And they only lasted maybe a year, not even. They had all sorts of stuff go on. And well, uh, Going ons are one thing, but did, but did anything happen that was detrimental or, or affected them negatively? Um, not that they would share with me, no. No, the kids. The kids says, "Well, you have to talk to dad. You have to talk to mom." And uh, it turns out they both died early too, which is kind of weird. They both died when in their early forties, um, which I was felt was a little strange. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and he was my accountant, <laughs> so you know, there there must be something. And you've obviously experienced it. There is something comforting when someone else experiences or witnesses something with you right because yeah. oh, i mean oh, how many oh, times have you seen something and you were by yourself and it almost like doesn't it make it feel more real when someone sees it as well well i love validation um i've had for instance groups of people that all shared the same sighting and then when you interview them all separately you know the descriptions are generally um consistent but things like time uh, duration things like uh, the, the order in which things happen can be all o- over the map so it's really good to have other people around so that you can get an accurate idea of what actually happened mm-hmm. and even with people sharing the same side and they'll even get details wrong it's pretty amazing right or uh, you get you just see things the same thing slightly differently. Like you might say, Oh, I remember it being a blue color. Someone might say, I remember the light being a green color. Uh, right. It doesn't mean either of you are wrong necessarily. Right. Yeah. You know, people do, um, you know, the rods and cones in our eyes do react differently from light depending on the angle and, and other things. Um, but it is it, 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 to get validation, I think is important. And uh, many of my best sightings have been, with uh, with other people in the car, or other people um, out with me sky watching, um, I've had you know objects within 150 feet of me in broad daylight, uh, where I had two other witnesses. Um, I had an object uh, flying right next to our car; uh, couldn't have been more than 40, 50 feet away. Um, with um, everybody in my band, except for uh, my drummer who was driving the driving the gear um so there was four of us in the car and we all saw and the drummer did too he was right behind us mm-hmm. and it was a, a riveting roiling uh, about baseball size r- ruby red light that flew right along inside our car for about maybe 100 feet 140 feet 30 feet and then zipped off down through the valley that was cool 
I have a question from Neutron in the KGRA chat room. And his question is, is the reported odor of vinegar, like on cattle mutilations, very common? Mm, no. Uh, vinegar? I haven't heard that one. Uh, have you Have you had any pungent odors that you can associate as a commonality between? No. No. No, the smell, the, the smell of cadaverine, <laughs> which is the molecule that makes rotten meat stink. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's one that I probably <laughs> am most uh, perturbed by. Um, I did have one case where uh, the animal had a a slight, like in um, disinfectant sort of, but but musky, a musky disinfectant smell. And the animal wouldn't rot. It was in a heated garage for two weeks, and it would not rot. So there was retarded necrosis and a weird kind of, I don't know how to describe it. It, was, it. it wasn't like formaldehyde. It wasn't like rubbing alcohol. But it was like something in between. And it smelled like antiseptic. Antiseptic. Yeah. Vinegar, no. I... I you know, I've smelled dried cow piss and all that, and I wouldn't describe it as, as smelling like vinegar. Well, I wonder, reports still do occur that fluids or something like ectoplasm uh, residue can be left behind. So one would imagine there would be an odor to, to something crossing between these worlds, possibly. No. No? Well, one of the reasons why um, I used to uh, really rely on my brother's uh, Pyrenees dog was mm-hmm. because whenever we got to a um, a mutilation site, he would be the first one out of the car, and we would film him uh, go around the site and show us where all the coyotes had been, and uh, and and very carefully gauge. You know, he was an unflappable dog; nothing freaked him out. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was 125 pounds. He was bigger than everything and everybody. Nothing freaked him out. And there were very, very few cases that he would not go near. And uh, that that was all due to smell. Um, he, there were some, but not many. And uh, if we wanted to know where the coyotes were and whether they came close to the carcass, he would go out and pee on the, on the bushes that they peed on. And generally, they wouldn't get within 40, 50 feet of the animal. Another question, and I think we touched on this earlier when we were talking about cattle mutilations. Is there still uh, reports of black ops helicopters appearing after mutilations as in the previous decade? You did say helicopters, but you didn't specify whether you thought they were black ops or not. No. um, In fact, um, in the 70s – hold on again one second. I'm just going to do a message here. In the 70s, there were quite a number of – all of drab, sort of like just home from Vietnam type helicopters. Um, but as the decade progressed, it was all different manners of helicopters, blue ones, white ones, red and white, yellow, um, all, all, all kinds of helicopters and all different types too, all kinds of colors and all different types. So um, the black ops helicopters, that's kind of a um, an assumption, I think can't really make that assumption but there have been helicopters sighted uh, within the last few years around mutilation sites although not as many as we saw in the 90s not as many no do you you think that there's a chance that this report that we spoke of earlier could be a red flag um that the numbers might start going up again yeah yeah Yeah. I, i think the fukushima radiation is probably the 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 most uh, important uh, covered up news story uh, on the planet right now. I, I, um, yes, yeah, and 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 I really do have a sense that uh, if there is a connection between residual radiation in the environment, then we should start seeing more mutilation cases on the West Coast, which normally don't get that many, uh, if any at all. Those vast stretches of um, Washington and Oregon and Idaho 
uh, well, not so much Idaho, but uh, Northern uh, California, where there's never been any mutilation reports. So we're now starting to see uh, with this case, uh, we're starting to see what could be uh, a whole slew of cases that are um, primarily and possibly there's sub reasons why they're uh, doing these cases. But I think one of the main reasons would be the uh, the measurement of um, uh, residual radi- radiation. And do you, oh, Chris, is that your phone? Yeah. Do you mind putting that on mute? It just we keep picking it up over here. I know. Sorry about that. I trying to do it. Yeah. All right. So I I do want to ask you too, since we're talking about this, you know, um, why do governments feel the need to initially hush hush something up? I I feel like the masses now, with all that we're exposed to, information wise and other, there there's. There's no mass hysteria. If there's an emergency, if something terrible happens, a meltdown, an explosion like in Russia recently, shouldn't the government just say, you know what, let's be safe. Let's assume the worst. You know, everyone get out of the area, be safe, and just be honest about what we have to learn along the way as we find out the more details, how much toxins um, or radiation are in the in the environment What's the big if if Japan if this nuclear power plant, um, you know, had a meltdown worse than we imagined? I don't think the people of the planet Earth are going to say, uh, "Japan, you're no longer good enough for us." Do you know what I mean? I, I don't I don't understand the reasoning here. What's the well, what's, the, what's the game? Well, what's the reasoning? Putting spent fuel rods a hundred feet in the air above the main reactor. <laughs> Can you believe that? So when when the thing blew up, all those rods came down and fell right into the reactor, creating this huge pool of molten uh, spent fuel rods that are still still you know still have tons of radiation in them. Oh, right, but that's the point. Is why not just be truthful outrightly you know vigorously open about what well it's a lot a lot of litigation a lot of uh um, the issues yeah the, the people i mean there are fishing people fishing right um well they, they they did they they moved everybody out and uh a lot of countries would not take seafood from japan and some still won't hmm. so and to me the japanese uh i mean they, they i think eat more seafood than probably any other culture but um, and I'm I'm a huge fan of sushi, but I can't eat it anymore. Wait, Only you, if, you don't eat sushi anymore. I can't because of this. Yeah, I'll eat Atlantic uh, fish, but I won't eat Pacific fish. So, do you think Japan has has done a good job? A hand no, disaster. No, there's no way that they can do a good job because they never figured out what to do once this happens. There is no way with our technology, that we can even ascertain what is going on, let alone come up with a fix. We can't even get close enough to, to see what, what is actually happening. We do know that that mass has hit the groundwater and that millions of gallons of water a day of highly radiated water is pouring into the Pacific Ocean. So for those of us who have continued to eat seafood, such as sushi, what do you think the effects could be? You're playing Russian roulette, you know, uh, tuna at the top of the food chain. Mm-hmm. Um, all all it takes is one hot particle. Um, we don't really, there hasn't been any official uh, public publicly acknowledged tests. Um, the last time I heard, they tested 39 tuna and every one of them showed elevated uh, radiation levels. Um well, that, that's interesting and scary. Um, is there a chance that you could be unaffected? Yeah, yeah, if you're lucky and you're able to, you know, not uh, harbor the uh, the hot particle, if you're able to get have it pass through your system. But um, I think it's important for people to really be conscious of of their food. I, I mean, I, I've been threatening for years to get a Geiger counter and go into a sushi restaurant. (laughs) 
and I, say, you, I'm guessing you would have to have a pretty sensitive one. Well, they're they're made. There's there's some that are made uh, for food mm. um, that are actually designed for that. And there are quite a number of sushi buyers who are using Geiger counters, from what I understand. All right. Well, Chris, we're we're again getting to the end of the show here. Um, before we go, are there any topics or comments you'd like to mention or share with us or thoughts? Well, just, you know, write everything down. I think it's really important for people to, especially if they live in an area that has, uh, you know, waves of activity, um, that has sacred Native American sacred sites, that has unusual geophysical properties, um, has in, interest by the military and the government. Mm-hmm. If you live in a place like that, it's probably a hotspot area and there's all kinds of portal-like activity around you. So keep a pen handy. I put a big calendar on the wall. And whenever something happens, I just write it in, in the square. It's amazing what you'll see when you go back in six months and and, and read all the stuff. You, you start to, you know, see patterns, all sorts of things. So it's important to write things down. And it's also important to come see me uh, at the end of the month, last weekend of uh, – the first weekend, I think, of um, September. September. Yeah, it's the International UFO Congress down in uh, Phoenix, Mm -hmm. and I'll be giving a presentation about my UFODAT project, which is a multi-instrumented sensor array that's uh, designed to to capture and scientifically uh, document um, aerial sightings. Um, We have recording magnetometers and gravimeters and accelerometers and GPS units, and we can triangulate and Mm -hmm. put everything into Google Maps and and uh, it's it's the real next step forward well, in the science good. of uh, ufology. So I'll yeah. be talking all about that. No, that's great. That sounds very exciting. And uh, we do need more tools in the, the field of ufology for sure. Um, I think that's one of the things that have been holding us back is innovative ideas and thinking. Um, if you want to find out more about Chris, you can go to OurStrangePlanet.com. Chris, thanks again for coming on. Sure. All right. So you've been listening to Paranormal Now, broadcasting live on KGRA Radio, Tuesdays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. To find out more, you can go to kgrradio.com slash paranormal now or paranormal now on Twitter and Instagram. And join us next week, Tuesday, again, for our Phoenix Lights round table with Peter Robbins, Mike Rogers, and Kevin D. Randall. So that'll be a really fascinating show. I'm very excited for that. Stay tuned for Fade to Black with Jimmy Church next. And special thanks to KGRA producer and Time Space Maverick Race Hobbs. Until next time, live in the mystery. Mystery.